ladies and gentlemen, it is showtime in the stables of soccer. Kickoff in the Casa de Calcio, the forward to the Fiesta from the fringe of fiends fixed foremost in football's front line. Oh, yes, it's that time again. It's BR Football Ranks, your antidote to the abundance of asinine audio accounts pouring persistently through your podcast providers. Don't be alarmed, though. The answer has come. We don't just talk about football here. We put it back in the correct order. My name is Jack Collins, and I'll be your host today, keeping my superstar colleagues in check, like Jimmy Kimmel hosting the Oscars. So, to throw it back to old blue eyes, Robbie Williams and Bridget Jones's diary. Have you met Dean Jones? Someone said as we shook hands, he was just Dean Jones to me. What a beautiful voice you've got, <laughs> young Jack. Good to keep going. <laughs> uh, and then hop on board, ladies and gentlemen, to HMS Titanic. His predictions are a little bit sink or swim. And we've hit a few ranking icebergs in our time. But near, far, wherever you are, his rankings will go on. Yeah, more sink than swim, but thank you for the faith in keeping me on and keeping me in a job. We will we'll always be here for the rank god, Sam. Always, always. A bit later in the day, we're going to be joined by former league Premier League striker and a true showstopper in his day, Marlon Harewood, to talk about his luxury lifestyle business. But before that, it's time for hot dakes. Dean, what you got for me? Well, I've actually got a bit more of a rant because I feel like the hype over Virgil van Dijk's 2v1 defending against Tottenham the other day needs to just be tempered a little mm. because it was a moment, uh, just to remind everyone, when Sissoko went through on goal and he was 2v1, Van Dijk's in the middle, Son's to one side, Van Dijk decides to usher uh, Sissoko away so that he has to shoot. It was good defending and he did the right thing because Sissoko missed his shot. But it's been spoken about like Van Dijk has suddenly changed the face of defending and like this is a revolutionary thing that nobody's ever seen before. I actually spoke to a couple of defenders before coming on and saying this just in case I was wrong. But they did both say, yes, he did do well, but it's pretty basic defending. Like that is a decision you make as a defender. You get your body shape right. You make a decision. Which one do you want to have the shot? How are you going to get in the way of this? And you go with it. Mm. That's exactly what Van Dijk did. Um, I just feel like sometimes he's getting a bit too much praise because he's had such a good season. Everyone's looking for things to highlight. The fact is, he let Sissoko get a shot in. Sissoko got his shot in. And to be honest, he should have scored. So what would have happened if Sissoko had surprised everyone, hit a left foot shot into the corner? Van Dijk would be getting criticised right now for not getting over, making a block, making a tackle, and it would be completely flipped around. So I'm not saying that Van Dijk is not having an amazing season. I'm not saying he didn't even do well in that situation. I'm just saying, let's put our foot on the ball a second. Let's calm down and realise that it was a pretty basic moment for a £75 million defender. All right, Sam, do you agree? I reckon I could have uh, done the same thing. <laughs> I was, uh, I, look, no. Logically speaking, what do you do in that scenario? You block the channel off to Hyung Min Son so he can't shoot, and you force Sissoko onto his left foot. You know Sissoko's not a great shooter anyway, but on his left side, his weak side, he's even worse, and you let your £70 million goalkeeper deal with a wrong-footed shot from an OK midfielder. Like The thought process is not exactly Einstein no. here. I, I I'm, pr I'm, I'm with Dean here. Like I, I love Van Dijk as... Um, like he's been amazing this season. He was top of my player of the year rankings for a reason. Let's take nothing away from his season. But what you said there about people looking for stuff to be impressed about, it's literally confirmation bias now with, with Van Dijk to the point where that, which was good, but not amazing, has been heralded as like he's the Dutch Maldini who has reshaped exactly. defender. Okay, but last week, everyone was being like, oh, he'd done terribly with Serge Gnabry when we all agreed that he actually had done fine, yeah. showed him into the channel. He quite hadn't quite got across, but it was actually just a, a wonderful goal. There was nothing wrong with this it. This is just another example of that. It's just yeah. flipped around. Like, everything he does is being highlighted so much. Like, there's a mistake against Fulham. Oh, no, look at Van Dijk. He makes mistakes. Oh, no, look, he's let Gnabry come in. Oh, but look at this. It's like, he's just being a defender. I don't know. I, I think that playing the percentages is the best thing you can do in that in that situation. He's obviously in the heat of the moment as well. He's obviously looked at the situation. He's had clocked that it was 
Hyung Min Son, being like, I'm not allowing him to get the ball. That's not happening. He, he stood, you know, away. He, he's pushed Sissoko wide. He's played all the percentages he can possibly do mm -hmm. in that situation. And that's what you can allow him for. No, you have to be able to allow someone for doing the right thing in a situation which could have co possibly cost his team the game and, and won the game and two the title. But there's like, there's a pundit in England, Martin Keown. He said something like, you don't, you don't, you won't read about that in a coaching manual. Really? What, what would it say in a coaching manual then? There what? is no coaching manual yeah, so for a start. What but. is he talking about? What is he saying most people would have suggested you do in that situation? I, I think most I think people would have closed the ball. I think most defenders would have closed the ball. I don't. No, not in no, that I, situation. I really, I really don't think what he did was that revolutionary. I think because you're two on one, because you're in so much space, you essentially just try and stop a one-two or a clear shot on goal and you shepherd one person over to one side to try and narrow that angle, which is what he did. And Sissoko really slashed at it because you could tell that Sissoko wanted to pass yeah. to Son. And like, as I'm saying, the decisions, all the decisions he made in those five seconds, fair enough, they're under they pressure. Were... You're 85 minutes in after a hard game against Tottenham. But but they're also, it, it hasn't reinvented the wheel. It is what you would expect a, a, a top level defender to do, or even just a Premier yeah, League level. defender. player of the year. Of course, he's doing good things like this. That's what he does. Yeah, of course. But that's it. Is no, it but there's too much hype around it. I've, seen, I've read 10 articles it? from people say, saying how it's amazing. Like, I've read someone tweeting comparing him to like Maldini. Like, no, calm down. So, okay. so, we, so we don't like it when he's overpraised, but we also don't like it when he's criticized for the wrong reason. So just consider us three. The, the, the moral arbiter and the moral level, the spirit level of Van Dyke. if you need to know if he played well or not or how well he played out you don't, of 10, You don't come need and to ask, do you, come if and he played to, well or not? Come and speak he to played us. Well. Come and speak to us about it. We will tell you exactly how well he played or not in real terms with no yeah. hyperbole whatsoever. Yeah, Van Dyke, None. good player, stop being surprised. <laughs> right. Move on. On that note, Sam, what's your <laughs> take? Okay. Uh, Zinedine Zidane started his son... Yes, Lucas Zidane in goal against Huesca uh, at the weekend. Probably the weirdest flex in football this <laughs> season. Fortunately for him, it did just about turn out okay. Just. Seemingly, just, they're one, three, two, just. Um, seemingly unfazed by this raging debate about whether he should play uh, Thibaut Courtois or Kayla Navas, two world-class goalkeepers. He went, you know what? I'll chuck a third name in there, my son, and see what happens. Now, I appreciate Courtois is, is injured and I appreciate uh, Navas had flown back from Costa Rica after the international break. But this is just like unnecessarily strange, yeah, right? It's weird, At it? this point, it's, it's, I, I appreciate that Real Madrid are on the longest preseason in history, probably for <laughs> probably five months. But I'm starting to think Zidane is like, can I make it the greatest mini banter era of Real Madrid history? Like Zidane's performance wasn't amazing. He made one save. It was an easy save. He made it look hard. Yeah. He considered two goals that weren't necessarily his fault, and he kicked the ball straight to Wesker's strikers a few times as well, giving the ball away and creating pressure. So hardly the kind of performance that, that had they not won the game thanks to a beautiful Benzema goal very late on, hardly the kind of performance that people wouldn't exactly just dig out and be like, well, what on earth are you doing there? If Navas is fit enough for the bench, he's fit enough to play. I just thought the whole thing was incredibly odd. So odd. So odd. It's such a power play, isn't it? He let in a goal after like three minutes. I know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was a good finish, though. It was, it was a good, finish. A good it finish. It wasn't actually his fault. But, um, is that him being like, I'm back and I will do whatever I want? Yeah, I think, obviously, Zidane is taking the opportunity right now. So he's going to give everybody a chance in this squad between now and the end of the season. Especially his themselves. children. But nobody actually thought he was going <laughs> to stretch that to be like, yep. And the first person to get that chance is my boy. <laughs> um, so this is like at Sunday League level where you're like, you know, the manager's da uh, the the play the manager's son always gets to play, even though he's necessarily the worst player yeah. on the team. And you're but like, it's going to be interesting now going forward because does he play him again? Because what happens to his confidence now if he doesn't get another game for the rest of the season? Does he think? Dad's seen enough of me. He doesn't want me <laughs> back Or did he go, Dad gave me a go when it was against West Ham? Like, he thought be like, to be right. fair, Dad, Courtois hasn't been that good this season either. Yeah. Like, I think I should keep my spot here. It's like, I've got Kayla Navas knocking on the door as well. Though, so. They were at home to the 20th placed team in La Liga, just off an international break. It was, it was the best time you could possibly have or choose for Zidane to play his son. And it nearly yeah, packed it fire. Very nearly you can't fire. doubt this man, though, can you? Zidane, everything he touches turns to gold at Real Madrid. So yeah. maybe this is an absolute masterstroke. I I'm going to put my head on the line and say it's not. <laughs> <laughs> I think that this was a terrible idea. And if it wasn't for a moment of magic from Benzema... Zidane would have been blushing real hard. Both Zidane's would have been blushing he real hard. He would have had hard. some big questions to answer. I mean, as it was, all the press in Spain 
I've written a lot of articles about this, and he was immediately quizzed. I hang on, why is your son in goal? By yeah. the way, like, what's going on there? Then? Where's this come from? For the record, by uh, the way, if you're not, sure, if, if you're listening, and you're, you're not actually sure, Lucas Zidane is actually a professional footballer who <laughs> plays for Real Madrid and has done for a while. It's yeah. not that he he pointed into the stands and said, "Hey, son, come and have a go." Like, he is a footballer, right? It's just that he has been a third choice goalkeeper. He's still still quite young, but he's it was his Real Madrid debut. Yeah, uh, first team debut. So that's that's the level we're at here. Yeah. He hasn't picked someone out of the crowd. Okay. All right. All right. Well, we'll leave it there. Not this if time. the dad starts picking people out of the crowd, then you know he's fully lost the plot. <laughs> yeah. He's like, oh, yeah, there's my seven year old son. <laughs> uh, he can have a go as well. Right. Um, so the third hot take as ever came from you on Twitter. We put a poll up yesterday. We asked if you were interested in whether the MLS should add relegation and promotion. I must add, this was added to me on Twitter. Uh, I just put relegation, which gets you just, you're down, that's it, like full stop, end <laughs> off. Um, that's not what I meant. Um, that got 35% of the vote. 21% of the vote went for underrated players in La Liga. Uh, but the winner by some distance in the end, was uh, who we thought was the best left back in the world. I'm interested that, one, that people chose this because I thought it was maybe the the, the broadest and maybe least exciting question. I was of surprised three. as well, yeah. I was surprised, but, you know, we are men of the people uh, <laughs> and we, we do do what democracy says. Uh, so, therefore, we, we're discussing best left backs in the world. I, I mean, I'd put the first shout on the table as Jordi Alba, of Barcelona, who's been consistently at the top of his game for so long, good defensively, excellent going forward, links up so well with Messi. There's not too many aspects of his game that you can really you know, judge in a, in a negative light. But I imagine that people will have different views. Nobody you, Dean. I imagine you will have a contrasting view to me here. Yeah, because the best left back in the world is and has been for a while, Marcelo. Now, I know that people straight away are going to go, no. oh, Marcelo's had a rubbish season. Yeah. And like, wow, yeah. Everyone at Real Madrid has had a rubbish season. It doesn't mean they're all rubbish footballers. What, is Gareth Bale a rubbish footballer all of a sudden because Real Madrid haven't been good this season? No. Marcelo is just suffering as a result of the fact Real Madrid have been suffering. He misses Ronaldo a lot. He wants to join Juventus. So that's <laughs> where we're heading with that. Marcelo is going to end up probably joining Juventus. And when he gets to Juventus, he's going to be a lovely footballer again. He's only 30 years old. He's yeah. one of the Champions League, is it four or five times? Um, How is he only 30? He's, he's only 30 years old. He's played for Real Madrid since like 2007, I think. It's a ridiculous amount of time he's been playing that position at the Bernabeu. He's been their best player consistently outside of the Galacticos forwards year after year after year. I just don't think that you can look at it just based on the last six months when the team has been completely out of sorts and suddenly dismiss Marcelo as a footballer and as a left back. I'm going to go to you because you're going to tell me that he doesn't defend. Yeah, and it also need to. He, he hasn't also, been defending for years. He's yeah. not a defender. He's, he's not. He's not he's been. Left. He has not been able to defend for more than six months. <laughs> he has not been able to defend for years and years. Has it been to the detriment of Real Madrid and Brazil? Well, no, because Ronaldo just bailed them out time yeah, it's, and it's, time it's, and time yeah. again. The only reason he how does... many goals has he has he influenced going forward? He's Quite... a wonderful attacking player. Yeah, no yeah. one's debating that. He's yeah. changed the face of being a left back. No, he hasn't. Yes, he has. No, he hasn't. He's followed on from That's... a man like Roberto Carlos. Yeah, yeah. Do you think he's you not know the first? He's not... Carlo Ancelotti, Zinedine Zidane, all these kind of people that have managed him. You're not asking the same question. Yeah, that's, that's, is he the best left-back yeah. at Real Madrid? The answer to that is no, yes. No, because if they wasn't, then they would have bought a better left-back to replace him because Real Madrid have been the best they team in the world. They weren't by Jordi Alba, were they? No, but they have, you, have to, you have to judge it within, within, the, within like the, Re the Real Madrid ecosystem. So as long as you can afford to justify Marcelo's incredibly attacking nature, and they did so with Ronaldo, it's fine. It's not harmful to you. It's when Ronaldo leaves that what Marcelo does is chaotic, kamikaze, and hurtful. And that's why he got benched by Reguilón. So that that's that's why that happened. You, I don't think I could. Fairness, that didn't go that well either. <laughs> I don't think I don't think I could really genuinely sit there and say that the best left back in the world is a left back who can't defend. So I go with Jordi Alba. I th I think Jordi Alba is probably the best over over a span, and I think he's the most well rounded at that top level. But I do want to mention Andrew Robertson I was here say, as well. Let's get some honourable mentions in. I do want to mention. I want to mention Andrew Robertson because this is oh. now this is now eighteen months at a very very good level, like top bracket left back level and he does everything as well he defends he has that tenacity he attacks well he crosses superbly as we saw at the weekend there actually isn't really anything that Robertson can't do from the in that left back sphere which you can't really say about Marcelo because he's about half a left back and half something else 
pretty much every other team that Marcelo played for, he'd have played on the wing. Because they'd have been like, yeah, he can't defend, but he's really good at attacking. We'll play him as a winger. It's only at Real Madrid you really get away Brazil, with that stuff. I, I want to ask you something, because obviously you're saying that he's going to Juventus. If he does, what happens to Alexandro, who's, you know, probably not quite in this top bracket, but probably in the conversation. Well, he's been talking about leaving for a while anyway. Where's he, he off to? Has he? Yeah, there's been loads of... There was a, he got closed. Man United were looking at him, weren't they, under Jose Mourinho? And that deal actually got quite far down the line until it all fell apart. Um, so Alexandro will move in on to other things because there's, n- there's just going to be no room for him. Still in got- football? He'll still stay in football, yeah, but he's going <laughs> to be like, lifestyle. oh my God, Juventus have just signed the best left back in the world. I've got to leave. He wouldn't say that. <laughs> yeah, he probably wouldn't. <laughs> he'd, he'd probably- he's a compatriot. He'll be like, what, Look, are they doing? what are they doing signing Brazil's second best left back <laughs> when, I'm, when I'm the first one? Can I do an honourable mention? Yeah, of course. Cool. Tagliafico. Yeah, lovely player. Nah. Lovely player. Obviously, he's not the best defender left back in the world right oh, now, yeah. but... Mid twenties, making his name at Ajax, gonna get a transfer in the summer. I, I, he can defend, by the way. He can defend better than Marcelo can. He can, and he can also get forward. And I think that um, he's been overshadowed as well because other people have been talking about other players in that Ajax team. Yeah, but he's if you very, watch them very enough, good footballer. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I want to put two two honourable mentions. No, I want to go back to this. How old is Talia Fico? Twenty six. At this, he's twenty six. Mm-hmm. He's so he's so surprisingly old. <laughs> Because he made the move over to Europe so so late. I think Taliafico is as good as he gets. Yeah, maybe. And I don't think he's good enough to play for a top European side. Okay, all right. Here are two people that are going to be good enough to play for top European sides. They both play in Portugal. Uh, one at Benfica, obviously, came across from Barcelona when he was very young, Alex Grimaldo. Mm-hmm. Uh, and also Porto's Alex Teas. Yeah. Uh, two wonderful left backs, Sam. Uh, and going into the, to the prime of their careers now. Yeah, Grimaldo's really good. I could see I could see the future for him. Tellez, I don't know, man. Best dead ball specialist. Bit of a set Europe. piece merchant for me at the top level. <laughs> yeah. Best dead ball in Europe though. <laughs> He's got an amazing corner, an amazing free kick, and he plays a little bit like I know when Lucas Dean used to play for PSG and Danny Alves used to play and they used to run, they used to push all the way up and play almost as a winger right on the outside. He does that very well. Uh, but I do think that Tellez's inf- reputation is inflated by his set piece majesty, and I'm not sure that he will I'm not sure that he'll, he'll achieve the career that Grimaldo does. I think okay. Grimaldo is one of the genuine future great left backs. I've got some breaking news just before we end this segment. I've just typed into Google best left backs, and I hadn't done this before. You know, we're trying, and to, suddenly, we're trying to give off an, an aura of, of expertise. Yeah, I'm going to tell you what Google's answer is, what comes up in order when you type in best left backs. Marcelo comes up first, Jordi Alba second, and then you've got Alaba, Benjamin Mendy, Marcus Alonso. The fact that Marcus Alonso is in this conversation. Alexandro. Oh, you should have stopped at four. Alexandro, <laughs> Felipe Luis, Luke Shaw, then Andrew Robertson, then Danny Rose. Yeah, so that, Google so we, we, solved it. Marcelo ranking in at one. So Google has got that wrong, so therefore you can agree with Google that you're wrong on that one. Right. Well, thank you very much for listening to me and Sam. Less for listening to <laughs> Dean. Um, it's, been, it's been a real pleasure. Uh, we will be back after the break with Marlon Harewood to talk about his luxury lifestyle brand and the things that Premier League footballers need to make themselves feel comfortable in their lifestyle. Welcome back to BR Football Ranks, Rank Squad. And we are joined by a very special guest. 137 Premier League appearances with West Ham, Aston Villa, Nottingham Forest and Blackpool in a career that boasted 144 goals in 571 games. One of the most exciting players that I remember watching growing up and now in command of AC13, the UK's foremost Premier lifestyle brand. It's Mr. Marlon Harewood. Are you right? Yeah, not too bad. How are you, sir? Good, thank you. Good. Good, it's a pleasure to have you on. Thank you. Uh, and today, kind of what we wanted to, to touch into is, is to get into your expertise and talk about the footballer's lifestyle uh, and the kind of the brands that come with that and the, the kind of you know, world that, that that is part of. And obviously you are a massive part of now. So uh, you're going to walk us through some of the things that footballers need to, oh, okay. to, be part of, you know, to be part of that world and part of that lifestyle. Yeah. And, and we'll see where we go from there. So okay. we'll uh, throw it to you and see where we go. What do you want to know? What do you want to know? Sam, you going to start us off? I mean, surely for starters, people <coughs> dress better than Sam is dressed today. So where would you, let's start with some pointers. Where would you tell Sam? What does he need to change about his swag? That's not where we're starting. <laughs> <laughs> That's not where we're starting. Do you not get hammered all the time? <laughs> or do they start on you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's why he's sitting next to you because yeah. you're bigger than us. <laughs> I've got, got Marlon to sit next to me today so that he can sort you guys out. Yeah, to be fair, me and Jack are keeping our distance. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, I mean, I think three probably, you know, we're going to 
kind of work through three different things, but we can start with, with clothes. I think clothes are a good starting point and, and kind of see where we go from there. But that's very much part of the lifestyle and the fabric now. Yeah, of definitely. It definitely. It's obviously players, they want to look good, feel good when they're going into training and when they're about. It obviously, it's a sort of a lifestyle when you're being a professional footballer. You have to such a, a level to maintain and and obviously the money is involved with what you get nowadays and they can afford to look good all the time and I would say clothes is about number three on the on the list I would say. In terms of you know you, you've been in that environment and, and going into those training grounds and, and all those things how important is that in, in just going in and feeling yourself and feeling like you're part of you know a wider community but also like you're like oh this is me this is my look this is yeah, my Yeah I, I suppose it's, just, it's in any job really that you go in um, if you're a solicitor or whatever you are you still have to look look the part look good and feel good when you're going into a job um, so it's pretty much the same but with football obviously the confidence that you have you, you need that day in day out so if you're feeling good that confidence still flies through you when you're training and when you're walking onto that pitch so do you notice it among people that are coming to you do you, do you tell when, when they're turning up like the the names that they're wearing the brands that they're wearing yeah you could tell it just comes well it depends on the person really everyone's individual and they whatever they like to do and what they would like to wear but when you're in that in that territory i think you sort of maintain a sort of level and you're buying them sort of clothes and you're going around looking the part and feel good. So Sometimes I do feel, though, that people are, are not quite nailing it because some, sometimes <laughs> some people... I look at people and they're wearing like a Gucci tracksuit or something. It's like, it doesn't look great on you. You're yeah, just so wearing true, it. so true. But just because you, you're wearing it just because it's Gucci. But yeah. yeah, that is what happens. And we're seeing certain brands, aren't we, come to the fore. Like over the last couple of years, you, you do see like, like Off-White, D-Squared and things like yeah, that. No, like really like certain brands seem to be leaping to the fore here and a lot of footballers are gravitating towards them. Whether or not they look any yeah, good in it them? Suits, yeah. is that, it's is a that trend, fair? isn't it? It's a, it's a trend, it's a lifestyle that they have and it's fashion. So whatever's in, peep the the high net worth people or play, football players, they want to be in that fashion eye line. So they wear what is there because I'm not into the, the big bulky shoes. And yeah. I'm not, not a fan, but they seem to wear them because it's yeah. a fashion thing. Has that, that changed? Gone, okay. Has that changed in, in the kind of, you know, the, the scope that you've been around? And, and obviously when, when I was younger, I don't remember this being so much a thing. Maybe that's just because it wasn't so publicised and yeah. all those things. But has the kind of way that people dress and the way that people want to look as footballers changed across the years? I mean, not, and I'm not just saying in terms yeah, of the fashion change. It's a good, good, good question. I think it has, really. Just just lifestyle and the money that's involved nowadays, it's it's more of a, how can I, obviously a fashion statement. Everyone wants to look good and it's like, it's like um, uh, what's the word I'm trying to use? Like, you know, when you're going into training, when you're going out, they want to look, make a statement, and, and that and that is in the fashion, in or like you said, the off white. So everyone's going to be wearing off white to say like, I'm um, can wear this, and it's obviously mm. the price of it, and the money that the lads get nowadays is is part and parcel of that. There is a fairly famous or maybe infamous picture of the Manchester United squad strolling down the street, and we're talking Paul Scholes, John O'Shea in some of the Nail widest school. looking trousers I've ever seen. <laughs> it really does seem to have changed or the onus is now on it because you look at that top, those are, those are series as a top tier squad, yeah. a series of top tier players. And I, I, Rio Ferdinand was involved as well and they all looked, I, I take I take that the, the season changes and that, but they didn't seem to be putting in as much effort back then as they do right now. I remember that picture. I think, was it on Rio's or Wayne Rooney's? Wayne yeah, Rooney's, yeah, I think. Yeah, Rooney's yeah, involved yeah, as well. The, the, the trousers that they had. Yeah. yeah, so it has changed massively in <laughs> fashion. <laughs> that, well, there's that classic picture of, of Leo Messi, isn't there, at the first Ballon d'Or that he that he was nominated for? And he's just there in like a short sleeve shirt. Yeah. And, and now those ceremonies are suited so... And booted. You know, suited and booted. glittering kind of... I don't think it came natural to him, though, no, did it? No, it, it didn't. It didn't come natural but to him. That's something that's interesting, isn't it? Do, do some players obviously some players take to that like ducks to water and some players are just not really that bothered and, and I yeah. suppose shaped by other kind of forces in, in the surround and you know you see Leo Messi now and he'll, he'll wear a suit but he's still not out there in you know bright bright uh, white and, and, it's and quite casual. It's just like I said it's the personality of the person um, him and Ronaldo they're, they're top class players and classy players and they, they look after themselves well and they dress well so and you can tell the difference between the two Messi's came later though didn't it he, I, I describe it as Messi's emo phase 
he like his tattoo. Yeah, yeah, he got, yeah, he got, he blocked out one entire leg with with black ink. Had a had a big shoulder tattoo. Went bleach blonde. Grew a beard out. I think he was just acting out from his parents. That's yeah. what it felt like to me. And it, it came at about age twenty seven. Maybe he just realised how good he was and he could do whatever Every he likes. likes. <laughs> yeah, I agree yeah. with that one. Yeah. Who are some Definitely. of the, the the best dressed guys that that you've come across or seen or like some of the top level footballers who really nail it? Have you got anyone in particular? Oh, Jesus, oh, that's a good question. That is. Um, GB always used to stick in my mind because you're Aston Villa fan, so you should know that. Who's GB? Um, Who's GB? Who's GB? I mean, I don't. He left. Oh, okay, but <laughs> you, you asked me a question of players, <laughs> and I, so I'm just gonna. Yeah, he, Gareth, he's very, Gareth Barry, I presume, right? Yeah, yeah, for me, um, was one of them. That's not someone that would jump out on you, would it? That's not someone you'd go. Uh, you know, I would have if you'd asked me as a, a fan. list of players. You know, as a fan, that like, just yeah, someone no, like. But, but that's that's an interesting one. Yeah, um, going back, people like I know Colin Cooper, very old school. I, who I grew up with, made my debut with Nottingham Forest. He was very smart, casual, looked apart every day, day in day out. You know, people like that stick in my mind. So me. when you're young and you go in and you see someone like that with a bit of authority, looks the part, mm. is there then pressure on you thinking? When you're going to training and stuff or turning up at an event with the lads, you, is there a bit of pressure even back then? Yeah, that's a really good question, you know, when you're going, because obviously you're, in, you're your own person, yeah. you're an individual and how you want to dress and how you want to feel. But sometimes when you look at him, you think, oh, yeah, I, I've, I've got to... I, I need to do a bit of that. Yeah, I need to look smart. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, yeah no, I, just, I just feel like sometimes that the players must be turning up to, in stuff that they don't really want to be wearing, but they think, oh, well, a lot of the other lads wear are wearing because, this stuff. Yeah, so you don't so, get hammered. Exactly, yeah, that, yeah, yeah. because that must happen a lot. I mean, A lot. You go back through Loads years. Loads of lads, yeah. <laughs> that, was, that was emphatic. Yeah. A lot. A lot. Tell you, us, you were the one doing the hammering, like I said, you? individual lads come in with clothes and they usually get either hanged up or thrown in a bath. Cut or, up. Yeah, cut up or anything like that. So they usually go home in training gear. <laughs> Have you ever cut anyone's clothes up? I haven't done it per se, but I'll just, I laugh when it happens. So it's quite, it's quite funny. But that's kind of the whole training uh, the training ground stuff, the changing room stuff. Like, I mean, walk us through a couple of the best training grounds and, and, and changing rooms that you were part of and, and any sort of groups of lads that stand out for you, especially in terms of yeah, that kind no, of banter, uh, that yeah, kind of laughter. I love it. West Ham, the four years I was there, the, the banter in that dressing room was just unbelievable. You, you have to have a strong character or you would have folded because just the, the banter was flying through. Everyone got it, even if you was senior or non-senior or just like, angry or bossy or whatever you was <laughs> you, you'd get it and it's just good flow and the, the lads there were fantastic to be fair every single one who was in that squad then are we talking oh god it's talking loads uh, Bobby Zamora Dean Ashton James Collins Anton Ferdinand Nigel Rio Coca um, Joby McAnoff Roy Carroll was um, Pards the manager Pards was the manager well, he, I, guess, I reckon yeah. he sets the tone doesn't he someone like he did. Pards Jimmy Walker yeah. Rufus Brevet they're all characters yeah. loads That's a Lee Bowyer, dressing room, yeah. Matty Everton Yossi Benio, gonna go on, Jesus. I get yeah. the impression Alan Pardew really encouraged all of it as well. Like, as to be fair, he did. Yeah. He did. That got us going really as a team. We did really well. Um, I think he he believed if they got got the team all together, then we could take on whoever comes in. He gets a lot park. of stick, Pardew, for the, for his personality. I know. I don't know why, because he's probably. Uh, everyone asks me who's your best manager. I say Alan Pardew, um, best team, West Ham. Just the time I had there, and obviously being in the Premier League, you want to play at the highest level, and, and I did that at West Ham. Scored quite a few goals and got us to a FA Cup final and scoring a goal in the semi final. It's just little things like that. Just and Pards was part of that. So. Mm. I can't thank him enough because I've had a very good career when I was there and playing in Premier League against top players. I was going to ask about that cup run because, you know, there there are those kind of great teams that sort of just seem to, to yeah. bond together and, and go on these kind of cup runs. And, you know, the kind of Wimbledon in the, in the late 80s kind yeah. of spring to mind. And that West Ham group seemed a bit like that, just a, a group of like really good friends that got on really well together and fought, fought tooth and nail and, and managed to get to a cup final. Yeah, just that. Uh, it was like an MK Dons team that um, we we bonded and when we went out there and, you know, like a, a cup run, you get all everyone gets excited, the club gets excited and the lads just wanted to do well and we did. And we went on a, a really good run. Obviously got to the final and it's probably one of the best finals I've seen Absolutely, well, yeah. being part of and seen to this day, to be fair. Mm. Right, let, let's shift this one on. So what have, what have you got at number two in, in this kind of list? Number two, I, I'd say it's jewellery, ju I'll say. Like watches and chains and rings and stuff. Because me personally, going for me, I, I, had a, I liked a collection um, of having a collection of watches. And obviously you can have one extreme to another, uh, whatever you wanted to buy. Um, so I'd say watches is, is my number two. 
what yeah. kind of what, what kind of difference is there? I mean, I suppose it goes back to the same kind of thing. But are people looking at you going, "Oh, nice watch"? Yeah, I might want one of they those. They do because yeah, yeah, yeah. you can you can see. Let's have a look. Let's have a look. This is my work watch. Because <laughs> 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 yeah. all my messages come through. <laughs> so yeah, no, it's it's a watch, like you said. Like people, when you're going around, it's nice to have a nice little bit of bling or. Or yet again, the personality that you are, whatever watch you fancy to wear on that on that day. Is it again something in the, in the dressing room that's that's spoken about? I mean, back in your day when you were playing, as as well as now, do you reckon? Yeah, yeah, probably worse now because the amount of money that's involved in football now. But back in the day, it was like having a nice watch. Is, is do they show? Nice. Does do people literally show off their watches, or do they wait for people to notice it and be like, oh yeah, yeah? Yeah, being honest, I bet they they wanted to show off. Like, yeah. <laughs> no who, point, who, who wouldn't? Like, it's just <laughs> not a normal thing to do. Obviously. Footballers get scrutinised because you're in the public eye all the time, but it's just a normal person would do the exact same thing. Um, so, yeah, some some lads are really discreet because it's just nice and you get the classy lads that, that likes an actual watch and likes the, the meaning of it and what it represents and stuff. And then you've got the other the other side that's uh, who's a bit, oh, I've got this one. Now. How much do you reckon we're talking for, for a modern player? How much do you reckon some players are willing to go and spend on a watch? I can't really say that, but there is an extortionate amount. It's got, we're talking thousands here, aren't we? Yeah, like of course. Tens, it's it's tens not anything. It's, it's yeah. a, you can have one extreme to another for all sorts of different things. So. Yeah. To the average fan, that I'm, I'm trying to put it into perspective for mm. people. and like, yeah. This is the completely different world from, from where your normal man's living. And you know, for a player to go and spend 10 grand on a watch isn't unknown at all is it's it it's the same as a businessman a yeah. wealthy businessman yeah, if absolutely. he wanted to spend the exact same amount he can spend it to how much he wants to whatever he wants to think obviously footballers get scrutinised which I don't know why but it's just a normal thing profile yeah, thing yeah, yes. a profile thing and Instagram as well has probably played a massive part in all this yeah it's massive Instagram nowadays social media is massive but at the end of the day he's still a normal person and in a wage and enjoying his football and, and if you've got a talent why not well, yeah, exactly. If you're if you're being given, you know, you take what you get for whatever you do. Like, yeah, and, and I'm always I'm always intrigued by this because play, people are always like, oh, they get paid too much. And then you're thinking about things. And you're like, I would take whatever I'm offered. To, I'd take right. the top yeah, the top would. amount I'm offered to do the things that I'm good at, yeah. right? And, and so yeah. therefore, it always strikes me as as weird that people are like, oh, they this is what they. And then, then you know, if you have that money, then why not spend it on things you enjoy? It's a, a strange kind of. Concept. It is interesting, really, because like I'll shift right at you. So if you was in that situation, yeah. how would you be? Yeah, being absolutely. honest, like, yeah, so, what would you buy? Would you buy a normal watch, or if you can afford an expensive one, would you buy an expensive yeah, of one? Would. Yeah, yeah. Of course. I think the, th the thing that I find um, interesting is I would be terrified of losing it or it being nicked. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that, that's that understandable. Is well, that's but, what insurance is for. But yeah, they're totally. Yeah. But I think that's the other thing on the side of it is like, where would I wear this watch? But of course, once you're mixing in these other circles, you're going to completely different places, restaurants, events. Yeah to anyone would normally. So you've got yeah. to kind of be part of that crowd to fit in and feel like you belong there. Because I reckon, from when I've spoken to footballers and people involved in these fields before, it's a confidence that you have off the pitch and you take it on the pitch. We yeah. spoke to Paul Pogba's barber on the podcast and he was talking about the stick that Pogba gets for his hairstyles. Yeah. And he says, Pogba feels, the better he looks, the better he feels on the pitch. And I'm guessing okay. it's a similar sort of thing. Yeah, it's everybody, really, in any job. Yeah. Obviously, we're talking about football, but mm. it, obviously they get scrutinised. But you, you feel good wherever you go because you look kind of sharp. You, not so much you, but... <laughs> <laughs> you're you're going to feel right in you, Marla. <laughs> but it's, it's an end job. You feel good when you go and get your hair cut, you feel fresh, and exactly the same with Pogba. Absolutely. Well, let's move you on to your area of expertise, which I imagine is going to be number one in this list mate yeah definitely car it's definitely got to be a car um for me it's a car um that in that order um anyone else might be different but it definitely was a car when you're going from to and from training going home driving around it's definitely having a nice car is is one of the one what of are we branding as a nice car then at the moment what are the what are the go-to vehicles you'll see them um it was mercedes at the moment because they do very good deals for for footballers, um, which they and the Mercedes nowadays are really nice to back then because they used to be used to call them sort of granddad cars, don't you? Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. but now they really they've changed it whole whole turn of cars now. They look really good, sporty, and uh, loads of footballers are driving them. Was that something that you know from kind of day one for you always stood out as, as cars? You know, and being interested in that is is it something that as soon as kind of it, it became a thing you were like I, I want a car I want a nice car yeah, and definitely. then I start from you grow there. up don't you like trying to pass your t driving test when you get to eight, uh, 17 18. what was your first car Punto 
fun so yeah so it's just like when you so, in the youth car. team and you just like want to pass your test being a young lad so it's definitely a car first one and you just how how are you progressing life is how your car progresses so, mm. so what, what color was the punto was it yellow black oh. you wanted him to have an in-betweeners car yeah <laughs> <laughs> i had three puntos to be fair did you yeah the blue one then the silver they just served you well for a while. Very well. Very good well. car. What, what do you drive now? On? I you... drive an A5. Nice. Audi A5, for my road car. That's mm. a, um, and I, I suppose like you know this is the this is your kind of your area. What's the what does the company do, and what's the what's the kind of thing that you've made a you know your unique selling point in in the summer guts? It's just um, advising and helping lads because um, I went through a bad experience. That's how the company uh, come about, um, and then. I just said to my business partner, um, Andy Cole, who I met when I was at Nottingham Forest, and we've been together ever since, because the company's been going 10 years now, um, we just said we're going to help lads um, when they're looking to buy a new car to make it as easy as possible for them so they don't lose a lot of money when they're coming out. Like you said, obviously, lifestyle, they get bored, and they tied into long deals and then they want to get out of it after a year and then they have to pay the price where we try and advise them not to do that. I imagine footballers are quite an easy target or were before you guys came yeah, around. See, that's the word you're not, it, I wouldn't say easy target. No, but people are looking to take advantage of them because they know they have money. Yeah, definitely. So like you're helping them out and, and stopping that from happening. Yeah, massively. That's what we try to do. But obviously an easy target is the lads should know as well. So it goes both ways, I think. It's about education, isn't it? I mean, we see it, we hear about this a lot in football right now, from social media to managing money and all the rest of it. And I guess purchasing big things like that is a significant amount of their of their money. That That's an important thing going forward for any young footballer, is the education yeah. off the field. It's massive, because I'm trying to educate them for life after football as well, because you, when you're in the bubble, you don't realise until it actually comes to an end. Then they think, oh, what's going on here? Yeah. So it's like I'm trying to educate them with, with the cars to instead of spending a whole heap of money on a car, which I want them to do and I don't want them to do, but doing it the right way. So that at the end, when they come to the end, they've still got enough money to look after themselves for the rest of their lives. Totally. I'm guessing they're, they're souped up, these cars. Are they? they're, not, they're not just the ones that you go. everyone else goes and buys. No, no, court. yeah, we could do a lot to cars at the moment, um, which is good to, to of their individual, what they want to do and what they want to achieve out of them. So, What kind of customizations are we talking about? Yeah, I was going to say, are there any standout, and these big standout We'll do ones? a lot of wraps at the moment, wrapping cars, different, so make them different colours. Uh, we could change colour of the wheels, brakes, the whole interior. We can change majority anything you want to change to to the car that you wanted to can I, can I get reason. a PS4 in and a TV in the back? Yeah, we could do that. Can I get a uh, Mercedes seven-seater, tinted windows? Sorry, I'm, sorry, he's, sorry, he's actually la- placing yeah. an order. I've <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I've, I've we can la- talk I've after if you want. I've lapsed <laughs> into a quote, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, yes. Must have had a pay rise. <laughs> 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 no, the, uh, PlayStation 4 and the TV in the back is like, is a, I think that's the one thing I'd be like, if yeah, I've got, really if I've nice. got, if I've got, I don't own a car at the moment, so that's the level I'm at. But if so, first I'll get a car, and you then need we'll, a punto before yeah. you get to any of these. Three, <laughs> <laughs> <Brilliant, that. laughs> then, we'll, then we'll talk cost like PS4 and TV in the back would be the one that I'd be thinking that's that's what I want. Yeah, we could that's do that because we do them do the Mercedes V classes now, and they've got all that in the back that we do for all the lads. I was going to say, is there anyone that has that kind of, or well, not necessarily to name, but like, have you done things that are like? People having sort of on the road moving bedrooms almost. You know, they they come into these things and they're like, right, I'm gonna just, I'm this is my space. Yeah. I'm being driven and this is my kind of, I can relax, kick back. Maybe if I need to, you know, go on an overnight journey or something, I'm not losing kind of sleep over it. We have we have done quite a few of them, but not to the extent of having beds and stuff because obviously we get in trouble because you can't with regulations legal, and yeah. stuff. But we have done um, vehicles that we've put stuff in the back that they feel luxurious and they're. Like the journeys is uh, more comfortable as possible for them. How luxurious does it look, Marlon? I mean, not, I'm guessing probably better than like an average living room. Like the the, the, the amount of they are nice quality they that goes re- into these. Yeah, yeah, they are really nice, really nice. I, I wish I had one in my day to <laughs> <laughs> driving back and forth from training because definitely would have been longer, longer in longer in playing football because it's, it makes you calm and collected, not driving, panicking if you're going. Sometimes lads live like two, three hours away because they didn't want to move, staying. And obviously these V classes are perfect for them to travel and forth. Do they drive themselves or do, do a lot of chauffeurs and stuff these days? Like, like, that's another thing because I would drive myself but yeah. obviously the, the high, when high net worth lads now they'll probably get drivers and stuff so it's quite... Is that just because you like cars and you like driving? Like, as opposed just, to... I think that's just because of a, a, a senior seen a person I don't really not not flashy I don't want to use the word flashy it's just like I I don't mind I'm not really bothered I'll drive my oh, my kids around if I was um, in that vehicle yeah totally fair enough just a different generation 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, completely. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for those insights and those stories. No, uh, right. Stick with us because coming up next are our classic closers, Bleacher Roulette and Sam's Nonsense Rankings. We'll be right back. Welcome back to BR Football Ranks. Time for Bleacher Roulette. Marlon, this is our, our special wheel. Uh, we're going to spin it. And yes. from there, we're going to get a load of questions. So I'm going to get Sam to spin it for you uh, for, for the first one. And then we'll see where we land. Go on, Sammy. That went on forever. Sorry, guys. Oh, wow. It really did. Is it going to go again? No, it stopped now. Okay, that's yours. Whose career would you rather have? Who is it? Out of Casillas or Buffon? Okay, this has got Jack written all over it. I actually didn't didn't write this question. Although I know, the answer, all these questions. The answer is simple. <laughs> The answer is easy. The answer is Cassius. Yeah? What? Yeah, absolutely, 100%. I don't no, know if I've I don't know. The greatest, manager, uh, greatest goalkeeper for maybe ever, actually. I'm going to put it out there. Um, this is why we do the roulette. Pro- <laughs> yeah, yeah. A proper... That was three against one, see? That's fine. A proper, like, hero, a, a, a gentleman... So you already know these questions? No, no, no. no, 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 no okay. Not at all. Uh, but a gentleman, as opposed to Gigi Buffon trying to headbutt referees, um, a proper nice geezer, uh, the man who came out after it's Mourinho... It's amazing, isn't it? Football's amazing with opinions, yeah. isn't they? The guy who came out after Mourinho split the Spanish squad and was like, I'm not having this anymore. I'm, I'm going to say sorry to all the Barcelona players. The man who healed the divide in the Spain squad. I, honestly, I love Cassias. Wow. Uh, absolutely. There you go. Uh, Jesus. But if you were to pick one, I mean, I'm going Buffon all day straight long. Straight away. Yeah. On the list. Yeah. If it came up, I'll be putting him straight on the What's list. What's Buffon one that Cassias hasn't? It's not about just what is won. It's just about just his career. His... Him as a person, yeah. everything. Like, you should put that to, to debate. That's a good question, yeah, to be fair. Really. I mean, that's it, Sam. I'm, I'm with Jack. Yeah. Are you? Yeah, I'll go, I'll go Casillas, yeah. <laughs> Why? The, 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 the trophies and the medals um, and the gentlemanly nature. Jack Jack summed it up perfectly. Like He did. I'm he not did. Saying, he sold not, it. I'm not saying he convinced me, but I can't argue. I think he it. did. I can't argue. Yeah, I think he did. I've done well here. He answered the question <laughs> for you. I mean, you. obviously, the fact that Buffon never got his hands on the Champions League and at this stage isn't going to do that is is a blot on his career. Mm. But... I still think like I'm having Buffon. Massively, I am. Do you think we've made too much of the fact that Buffon hasn't won the Champions League? Do you think it's been overblown? Because like, how many strikers are there that are still considered great and haven't won the Champions Champions League? League? Yeah, yeah, it happens all the time. But just because it's a one-off position that. Um, there's only so many individuals that you can judge, like you're judging football clubs not, not winning Champions Leagues. I think that that becomes too much of an issue. Obviously, he has had the opportunity to win Champions League, so you can scrutinise it a little bit more. Yeah. But I think it's a bit more of a, a sad story than anything that he hasn't got his hands on the Champions League. So it's a bit harsh to judge him on that because he's done everything he possibly could have yeah. to get there. And he's still well, playing. Yeah, like, he's and he's class player. absolutely still top class. Oh, you two, I love this. Selling it massively. <laughs> Good Anyway, it's a draw. We'll have to put it to the vote on Decent. Twitter. Yeah, yeah. We'll, put it, we'll put that one out. We'll see who it Shall I spin for me? Go on, spin yeah, for you, spin. Sam. Is that, yeah, that one? Okay. How old were you when you realised... <laughs> this doesn't apply to Marlon either. <laughs> but you can sit in on this one. Uh, how, how old were you when you realised you would never make it as a pro? What? Footballer. Well, I haven't really. Well, I'm, I haven't got there yet. <laughs> <laughs> I like Jack's, go, Jack's gonna be like forty years old one day. And be like, I can still do this. I, I like the faith. I, like, I, like, I like the faith. Um, for me, it was probably much earlier, uh, pro- much earlier than most people. Or I gave up much earlier than most people. I was actually quite decent. Um, not that what Dean and Jack on, say on this podcast would ever make you believe, mm. but I do. I do remember having a trial with Reading uh, yeah. at around. Oh, uh, mate, one of these sob stories about a trial. Yeah. I, I bet you hurt his <laughs> knee as well. A, no, 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 no. I was. I was actually fine. Uh, not amazing. Not not rubbish. I, I, was, I, was, I was good. I was fine. Um, but I also good. understood from a very early age. They basically my, my parents really like told me how much travelling and how much time I would have to put into it. I'd have to go after school two nights a week to go to the academy. And I could see some of my classmates. One got picked up by Southampton, one went to Chelsea, one went to Arsenal. And I knew from them just how much time they were spending playing. I just couldn't be asked. <laughs> So it, mate, so you are not not attitude. a footballer because you couldn't be. Yeah, no, that's not. that is actually the only reason I'm not a pro. <laughs> um, so about age seven, uh, I, I, t- I, I basically seven. Ba- I balanced it up. I thought that's not really worth the time. <laughs> I, and to be honest, those guys that got picked up by Chelsea and by Arsenal by Southampton, one made it to uh, about the fifth or sixth tier of English football, 
and the other two didn't make it. And they put in way more than I would as ever willing to do. Mm. So I think the decision's been vindicated. Fine. Can I flip the question? Marlon, what, what age were you kind of when you realised you thought you, well, you made your first kind of moment that you were like, I am going to make this. I'm, I'm going to kind of, I'm going to get there. Question. Probably about 16, 15, 16. As late as that? Yeah, because I, pl- I was 13 when I joined Nottingham first. I was going to say. And then went through the ranks and then... When you start getting to 15, 16, then that's where your schoolboys. Yeah. Start See, I was the opposite of that. I was at F- I joined Fulham when I was thirteen, and when I was fifteen, I remember playing and I actually remember going out for dinner one day. And my my, my dad was like, "What are you going to do when you finish school?" Mm. I was like, "I'm going to be a footballer." He's like, "You're absolutely not going to be a footballer." Oh wow! <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, "Cheers, I, Dad." I, I just remember. That. I will <laughs> never forget this dinner because it wound me up so much. I mean, he was he was like. You are a good player, but yeah. if you make it as a non-league footballer, then you've yeah. done really well. Like you're not going to play oh, wow. like as a professional footballer. And obviously, it got I got more and more wound up. I don't think I spoke to him for about a week afterwards. But then I was released from Fulham, did play a bit of non-league, and at that point, yeah, good question. Didn't you know? fancy I've never really it. heard that before. Um, you asked, like a, a pro or an ex-pro, when did you think? You would make it. Yeah. Yeah. When do you think Cristiano Ronaldo figured he'd make it? Probably as soon as he was born. Age two. <laughs> <laughs> Probably standing there. Like. <laughs> Learned to walk and thought Started this working yeah, straight it. away. Well, I suppose it comes back to the whole thing. Like, you know, we, we've talked about players like Jamie Vardy who, you know, worked their way up, you know, got released yeah, and then worked their way back up the, the kind of pyramid. And it, it does go to show that, you know, do some people do just, you know, they get released and they give up. And, and then that's that. someone like Andy Robertson, for example, mm. who, you know, we talked about earlier, but who was released from Celtic and, and then spent load, you know, up to two years ago was just sort of kicking around in the, in the Scottish second division. And we're yeah. like, what's going on here? And then suddenly he's, you know, one of the best left backs in the world. It does go to show that, you know, Calm down. it's not all, well, <laughs> it's not all, uh, it's not all kind of done and dusted at such a young age, but it does feel like that often, it right? Does. It does. Mm. Let's move Are on. you sticking with the, um, I can still make it, Jack? Um, I was, I was just always really quite small. Um, um, and while that isn't necessarily so much of a hindrance now, I, I think it was going out. I was like quite technically okay, but mm. I just was really, really little. Um, mm. I didn't have a growth spurt until I was like 16, basically. Um, so I was really, really small. You had a growth playing. spurt at 16? So you gave How up. tall were you when you were 15? Oh, mate, I was really small. I was like really, really short. Um, <laughs> we're talking like three foot eight. <laughs> yeah, no, no, honestly, it was, it was, I was like the smallest person at school. I, mean, I was I'm the smallest short, person but... in the year and the year below me at school <laughs> until I was 15. So I thought yeah. you were the mascot. <laughs> yeah, they honestly did. I played for Brentford for a year or so, and um, yeah, they were like, I'm mate, just... you shouldn't be in the under seven. They were like, team. <laughs> 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 that was the only way I was getting by. Playing the year groups underneath. You know, you were doing well when your year groups above you, but yeah. I was actually year groups below because they were like, you can't play in that year. You're yeah. too little. So yeah, that was um, it. Was young. <laughs> All righty. Okay. Who wins? A team with perfect technique who aren't allowed to run or a team of supreme athletes but they can't kick the ball straight? Um, They're not allowed to... They could walk. What's well, your walk. question, Jack? Yeah. You've got to answer first. Yeah, I think the team with technical ability win this game. Um, you know, it's one, it's one thing being able to run around a lot and I do appreciate that, you know, pressure and, and intensity does help. Okay, but don't get tired. I think that the technical team win. You're not going to score a goal if you haven't got any technique. Mm. Can't kick a ball straight. Yeah, you're going to aim for the corner flag. Well, yeah, that's it. If you goes aim, in. if you aim, aim again, the wrong it goes place. in. We've got a couple of lads in the office who can't kick a ball straight, and every now and then at five aside, one goes into the other corner because the keeper has absolutely no idea where it's going. Yeah. So and um, they were, and they no were names, aim, but and they were aiming for the other corner as absolutely. well. Absolutely. What's your reckon, Marlon? It's interesting. You going for technical? I'm going for technical ability. Ooh, it's a bit. You must have seen some players who. Obviously, a r- really, techni- really good athletes, but not as good technically. Yeah, and then the flip side of that, yeah, definitely. And but the the fitness does kick in to f- the game now because you've got players that are playing up to 90, 90 minutes, ninety five, and they're still like running. And they're intensity. being monitored as well, so they can't even turn off. High intensity, <laughs> so mm, it's a bit of. I'm gonna go with the fitness one. Oh mm, yeah, fitness. Yeah. Sam, I'm gonna go the, the walking lads. Absolutely, they put on an absolute clinic. Um, and they and they move the ball about and tire the other team out so much 
that the callers he tells and they win. Mm. My dad actually started playing walking football yesterday. Did he? And, and he was did he enjoy it? Uh, he did enjoy it, yeah. He was talking about um, his technique and he reckons he's been spotted by Chelsea's walking <laughs> football team already. <laughs> so um, it, we'll soon find out about the athleticism versus technique, technique thing yeah, when yeah. I go and watch him down at, uh, down at his walking football. Also, it just goes to show, I, have to say, I haven't given up yet, nor has Dean's dad. He's turning <laughs> 60 and he's making a comeback after 32 years. Good man. Good man. <laughs> right, Dean, get rid of that beer belly, isn't it? I'm going to spin for you. Oh, red. That looks like the same one. It's not though. Whose issues have cost their team more, Rabio at PSG or Icardi at Inter Milan? Great question. This Jesus. great question. We got this on uh, on an Instagram. So shouts out to. That's this. Add some context to it. Rabio uh, is on the verge of being, seemingly on the verge of being fired, according yeah, to reports. Doesn't want to play he just doesn't, just doesn't turn up or doesn't want to play for PSG. Not in favour with the manager. Contracts up at the end of the season. They're basically just going to call it a day. Um, Mauro Icardi. We don't know what's going on with Mauro Icardi. No one knows Icardi. what's going on. No well, one knows. One, chaos. one thing we do know with Icardi is that his missus is his voice piece and she's not helping matters, is she? No. Um, I don't think so, no. no. <laughs> so I think um, whose issues have cost their team more? I'm going to say Icardi. Mm. At Inter. Yeah, at Inter, because Inter really, really need Icardi in top form. Mm. And um, his wife is um, making decisions make for him, it, it seems, yeah. and making things much if worse. If she is, it mm. seems yeah. she, you know, shouldn't be. she shouldn't no be. No disrespect to her. If she is his anyone. agent, though. She is his agent. Yeah. But yeah. even yeah. if she she's his first. agent, like, Who, she is his agent. Yeah, his agent. He should man up and do his own thing and <laughs> he do needs what he to. Wants he to needs do. to decide. Like, if he is wants to be this Inter Milan great centre forward and really help the team at a time when they. They've needed it at times yeah. recently as he well. He needs to make a decision. He needs to make a decision, not, not, exactly that. Not, and he's so hand. important. He's such that. a good player. Yeah, he is. I understand that she, she's his agent or whatever she is, but he still needs to make a decision. And he's not just playing for no Joe Bloggs team. He's playing for yeah. a massive team that's looking I can't imagine what it's like at home with those two. And he's like, I really want to play. She's like, nope, no, we're sticking to our <laughs> morals. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we you know who has a trust in that relationship. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We we really have no idea what is going on there. No. But what we what we can say is that in the time that he has been out, Inter have basically lost two of their last four league games, and they've been knocked out of the Europa League, which is their only legitimate shot at, at silverware, I think, this season. So if that's was. not if that's not was yeah, if that's not damaging to the team, I really don't know what is. He is the captain, the talisman, the star striker. He's one of the best strikers in the world. And he's not playing for them, and they are feeling it. So, as good as Rabio is, is there any news on him? Does he know? Is any teams coming in? For a lot him of teams are in for him, yeah. But um, I think it upset? sounds like he wants to stay at Inter. Like he's it, just not allowed it, to. It does sound the noises like, he's making. It does sound like they think it, <laughs> he's going to stay at Inter, but it's like, well, play for Inter then. <laughs> it's all play. very strange, isn't it? Mm. Um, I, I would put a, a little shout in for Rabio. You know, my, you know, PSG. Uh, with Rabio in the side, are a better unit, and I think probably would be further along in the ch in the Champions League. No disrespect to Man United. Um, Was I, he in I, charge of VAR or something? Well, I just think that with him in the in the side, yeah, good, good, good. <laughs> I think with him in the side, they just control that game far better, and 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 you get the you know odd better killer pass, you control possession better, you tire United out more, and, and I think that they probably go through. And and so given that. PSG are so hell-bent on winning the Champions League, are so, like, obsessed with winning the Champions League. Maybe that, in the kind of grander scheme of things, is more of a, you know... Yeah, I think they can replace issue. him, though. I don't think... Oh, I agree. I agree. No, but Jack's saying that ship on this season has sailed. Yeah, yeah Although, precisely. Uh, to, to be honest, I, I honestly, like, that United win, um, one in a hundred, like, utter fluke, I think, honestly... Brilliant. And that, and that, United, and, and first and that's, eight of them. Yeah, brilliant. But, that's what but it's very, very fortunate. And Rabio or not, that was that that weird thing happened that night. And oh, now I'm not having oh. it, Jack. Sorry, Marlon. Before we move on, is there any games you were a part of that you can remember where you got absolutely hammered and you won, or you got or you absolutely hammered someone and lost? Uh, that kind of stick out because. You know, th those games... Yeah, like the, <laughs> <laughs> All the second, I imagine. Yeah. Fans All only remember them. when you yeah, no. where play well and lose, don't yeah, they? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I'm one of them people, like, if, we, if we're doing really well and we're losing, then you get fuming. But if we're not 
performing and winning games, then no one's really bothered because when you go home, everyone's worrying about that three points at the end of the day. Totally. Fair enough. Right, Sam, do you want to close us off with your nonsense rankings this week? Have mm. you, what have you got in the back? We haven't even so, warned Marlon so about this. We haven't this, warned Marlon. Marlon oh, at the end of every episode... You warn me. It's in my contract. <laughs> <laughs> at the end of every episode, Sam takes uh, a random topic and ranks things about it. So last week, for example, he ranked Trent Alexander-Arnold's names. Which yep. th- of the three names, which ones were his favourite? Uh, this is the kind of bizarre topic, and you just got to kind of run with it, I suppose, yeah, and let him yeah. do it. Um, so just Sam, smile and laugh, smile what, and laugh, Marlon. What, what have you got this time? Well, it was. Do, you my... Want to do my names? <laughs> I'll just throw you, throw you right off there. <laughs> it was my birthday on Sunday. Um, um, we're not going to sing happy birthday, happy birthday or anything, so move on from that. I had a nice time. Well done. It was good a nice night. weekend, good. Good. despite the fact that my mum tried to steal some of the limelight because it was also Mother's Day in the UK on the same day. First so time inconsiderate. That, first time that's ever happened. I've warned her it shouldn't happen again. Um, <laughs> she didn't take me very seriously. I bet she didn't. I'd just like to make it clear as well, Marlon, you're excused from this because we only met today, but I uh, had some birthday drinks with the Bleach Report guys and uh, one of the two panel members yeah. turned up. Oh, okay. And the other one didn't. Can you so guess? So any, you any who get, your friends are then? Any guesses? Who turned up and who didn't? It's interesting because if you, I would have said someone else because I don't say them two wouldn't have turned up at all. <laughs> <laughs> Fortunately, I do have one friend in the room, and in, yeah, it's Jack. Thank you, Jack. You're Dean, wel- you're welcome. Man. Something about a one-year-old kid. Not, yeah. bu- not buying it. Anyway, you just forgot, didn't you? Yeah. I had a really, I had a really nice birthday, and it just got me thinking: was it a top three birthday? <laughs> You're ranking your top three birthdays. You're ranking your own birthdays. So I've ranked my top three (laughs) birthdays. And and we will kick off at number three with Sunday, which was my 29th birthday. Uh, My girlfriends and uh, my my two best mates and their girlfriends and wives. So, you know, the boys and the wags. We we went off to a a, a little kind of cottage thing and we just had like a a, a weekend where it was quite loose, quite fun. Good time. And then we had the, the BR drinks that Jack came to. That was decent as well. Yep. Um, again, Marlon, you get the pass there. That was pretty good. I had a really right. good. It was over an extended period of time. Yeah, come on. Into I'll number go. two. In 2012, when I turned 12, <laughs> another very good one here. Group of friends of mine, we went In to... In 2012, you turned 12? Yeah. Is that okay? <laughs> That's impossible. In 2012, you were not sorry, 12. 2000, <laughs> sorry, 2002. I was about to say. <laughs> you're, 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 you said you're 29. No, yeah, yeah. Sorry, in 2002... Good catch, Dean. In 2002, Thanks, when I turned 12... Yeah, that's why I didn't come to your birthday, because you're rubbish at maths. Um, <laughs> I had another very good one. We went to the cinema and watched Ice Age, which is a fantastic film hey, with a group of friends. Birth, though. <laughs> and <laughs> just let me finish. And just let me finish. I got given an Xbox with six games. Pretty good. Now, now that's the killer. Oh, wow. An Xbox, was, was an the Xbox... Xbox in the back of a car? <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, you're ranking your birthday. You should be. Are they ranking the show on that bit? Because <laughs> you would be falling very quickly. <laughs> Do you not think that sounds like fun? Xbox and six games. Your no. <laughs> ranking your birthday. Are you not, a, ga- are you not a gaming guy? Nah. Okay. Well, I, can, I don't know why I didn't come to your birthday. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, one, <laughs> yeah. About I one say. Let's see if I would have come to the number one birthday. Tell us about your best ever birthday. You definitely would. I think, all right, so year R, which is reception in England, so it's four or five years of age, right? Hang on, you haven't had a good birthday for 24 years. <laughs> That's not what that says. This is the best one, right? About the last best two. one. So I had a pirate, a pirate-themed costume party at my house, and my whole school class came, every single one of them. We had a treasure hunt in the garden. We played all your classics, musical chairs, Twister, whatever you like. And then on the Monday, we got asked to write an essay. What did you do at the weekend? And because literally everybody went to my party, 30 people went, I went to Sam's birthday party. We were living that through, through the weekend and into the school week on the Monday. Everyone was talking about it. Right, I am gobsmacked. That's quite enough of that. I am absolutely uh, gobsmacked. With that in the bag, that's very much going to be <laughs> it for us on this week's BR Football Ranks. If you've enjoyed it and not that last bit, please don't judge us on that last bit and you're not already. <laughs> get over to iTunes or Spotify or whichever it's podcast different, platform different. you like. I had a good time, Marlon. I had a good time. What, at sure a pirate birthday or ranking them? All of it. <laughs> I'm not coming to your 30th. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, big one next year. Big one next year. Um, we'd love your ratings and reviews on iTunes and all that. Uh, and remember, you can hit up any of us on Instagram or using the hashtag BRFootballRanks on Twitter. All that's left for me to do is say thank you to Marlon Herwood. Marlon, how can the Rank Squad follow you and AC13 on social media in that? On AC13 Premier on Instagram, Twitter and um, LinkedIn and on Facebook. Yeah, you should all do it. There's some really cool stuff on there. You get to see the players picking up their cars and stuff. I was going to say, the maddest social media for the maddest cars and and all those bits. So definitely get following. Uh, Thank you ever, as ever, to this duo of devilment. Sam Ty. 
Happy birthday to me. Dean Jones. <laughs> Happy birthday, Sam. Yes! There it is. That's what he's been waiting for. I've been Jack Collins. Please keep spreading the word about the Rank Squad to your mates. We are growing real fast and we're, it's absolutely brilliant. We are loving it. We will see you next week. Take care.